Welcome to section 6.1. Today we want to start talking about inner product, which is also called dot product, length and orthogonality. And I want to give you a preview of why we're doing that. As we know, not all linear systems are consistent. Here's an example of an inconsistent linear system. How do I know it's inconsistent? Well, call A is, I'll just remind you, down here, number two. It's the set of all B in R2 such that AX equals B for some X. Well, call A is also spanned by the two columns of A. Now, column two is a multiple of column one. So here, call A is spanned by the single vector one, two. Well, three, two is not a multiple of one, two. 3, 2 is not in call A. So here's 3, 2 out here, but this is call A, this line here. And so there is no X such that AX will be over here. And what we want to do is find the X such that if we have to live in call A, we're going to be closest to, to this vector. So we want to find the X such that AX is going to lie on this line, but be closest to this vector. So we have to talk about what closest means. So let's just start with dot product. Now, I've got a couple of examples of dot product here. And just to keep this video short, I'm going to have you read this on your own. Just curious, um, check digits. I thought it was very interesting, actually. I didn't know how um, ISBNs were formed, but this is how. So I'll have you read that, and I'm just going to jump in and talk about the inner or dot product definition. Now, this is the dot product we know and love. Nothing's changed except the way we're defining it. We're saying that the dot product of two vectors in Rn is the matrix product U transpose times V. Okay, so here's an example. Here's U and V in R3, and I want um, U dot V. Okay, with our new definition, that's U transpose, which is a one by three matrix times the matrix V, which I'm thinking of as a three by one. And that's, take this row and dot it with that column. That's 18 plus two minus 15, which is five. Okay, and so that's what we would have gotten if we had dotted this before this class started, right? So you can keep dotting the way you always have. Just be aware that um, now we can think of it as U transpose V. It's nice um, when you're proving theorems to think of it like this. So let's do PP, pause and practice. You guys try and find the vector U, I can, can barely read it. It's U dot V over V dot V times V. Okay, hopefully you did that. W is equal to, I'm just going to do this in my head, u dot v is negative 2 plus 15, that's 13, over v dot v, which is 25 plus 1 is 26, v. Okay, that's 1 half, and v is negative 1, 5. So that's negative 1 half five halves. Okay, properties of dot, nothing surprising. It's commutative, uh, distributive, and scalars can, sorry, yeah, commutative, I said commutative, commutative, <laughs> distributive, um, and scalars can move in and out of dot anywhere. So if, I, if the C is a scalar, you can you can um, pair it with the U, you can pair it with the V, or you can move it out altogether. And finally, U dot U is always greater than or equal to zero because it's a sum of squares, and it's equal to zero if and only if U is the zero vector. And I'm going to let you read those proofs on your own, and I'm going to talk about length. The length, or sometimes we call norm, of a vector is, we use double bars for length, it's the square root of v dot v. Okay, square root of v dot v. Um, and a unit vector is a vector whose length is 1. 
And here are two useful facts. Sometimes we like to get rid of the square root. And so we'll write this equation as the length of v squared is v dot v. Okay, same, same equation, just writing it slightly differently. Sometimes it's nice to write it like that. And then a unit vector in the direction of v is v over the length of v. And if you've taken Calc 3, then, then you're used to finding that vector. All right, so let's do some examples. Find the length of v for v equal to this vector. So length of v is the square root of 6 squared plus negative 2 squared plus 3 squared, which is the square root of 36 plus 4 plus 9 which is square root of 49, which is 7. Okay, let's do pause and practice. Find the length of v for this vector here. And notice for the rest of this chapter, I'm going to start writing my vectors in um, linear format. Now, this is a column vector, but to indicate it's a column vector and write it as a row, what I'm doing is using parentheses and a comma between the entries. So that's to distinguish it from the row vector 12 over 3 space negative 5 over 3. Whoops. Divide. That, so that would be a 1 by 2 matrix. Instead, I'm just writing a column vector like this. Okay, so go ahead and find the length. All right, so if you did that, you got length of v is square root of 144 over 9 plus uh, 25 over 9, because the negative squares out. And that's the square root of 169 over 9, which is 13 thirds. All right, and let's use that to find a unit vector in the direction of that same vector. So B and C are related. I want a unit vector in the direction of V. So I want V over its length. Okay, well, if I'm dividing by the length of V, the length of V is a fraction, so I'll multiply by the reciprocal, 3 over 13, and then V is 12 over 3, comma, negative 5 over 3. And so that gives me 12 over 13, comma, negative 5 over 13. And you can check that that is a unit vector. If you find its length, you'll see its length is 1. Okay, distance and orthogonality. The distance between two vectors in Rn is the length of the difference. So that's the length of... For u and v, that would be the length of u minus v, which is square root of u minus v dot u minus v. And here's a picture. If this is u and this is v in standard position, u minus v is the vector that goes from the tip of u over to the tip, sorry, tip of v over to the tip of u. And by definition, u and v are orthogonal if their dot product is zero. They're orthogonal, meaning... They're perpendicular, so synonyms for orthogonal are perpendicular, perp, or normal. Perpendicular, normal, orthogonal. And then we have a Pythagorean theorem that says u and v are orthogonal if and only if the length of u plus v squared is the length of u squared plus the length of v squared. I think I put a proof of that on the last page. So let's do a few examples. Find the distance between u and v. So distance is going to be the length of u minus v. So that's the length. Let's just do u minus v in our heads. If I take u and subtract v, 4 minus negative 4 is 8 and 2 minus 3 is negative 1. So I want the length of that vector. So I want to take the square root of each component squared. So that's 64 plus 1, square root of 65. OK, 
Okay, here's another one, pause and practice. You do it, find the distance between these two vectors. All right, start with the same thing. We're gonna write down the formula we're using. And then in this case, u minus v is negative five, whoops, I forgot my length, negative five comma, two plus three is five, so that's the square root of 25 plus 25, which is the square root of 50. And you can leave it like that, I'm fine with that. Or you can write five root two, they're the same thing. Okay, use the definition to show that u and v are not orthogonal. So I, by definition, I don't mean use the Pythagorean theorem, I mean use this definition, um, u dot v, is zero if it only, well, if u, is, u and v are orthogonal. So what we want to show here is that u dot v is not zero. Okay, that's pretty easy. u dot v is negative 12, three uh, minus six. Notice I'm just dotting the good old fashioned way, plus zero, which is negative 18 which is not zero, so therefore u and v are not orthogonal. And then on the next page, I have shown that u and v are not orthogonal using the Pythagorean theorem. So I showed this. So you can read through that on your own. And then on this page also, I have just copied down the rules for finding a basis for um, row A, call A, and null A where A is a matrix, uh, because we're going to use that on the last page and you may have forgotten. So finding a basis for null A is, you probably haven't forgotten that because we still do it so often, but call A and row A, there are the rules for that that you can refer to when we get to that last page. Okay, last big topic of the day, orthogonal complements. If W is a subspace of Rn, then a vector is orthogonal to W if it's orthogonal to every vector in W, okay? So we call that space, the set of all vectors that are orthogonal to W, we call it W perp, and it's the orthogonal complement of W. So in English, it's the set of all vectors in Rn orthogonal to W. In math, W perp is the set of all X in Rn such that x dot w is zero for all vectors in w. So you should know this definition. <clears throat> now, two, two things. One, w perp is a subspace of Rn. It's easy to show, and I think it's one of your homework problems in my math lab that walk you through that. So w perp is a subspace. And two, this one's really important because to check if a vector's in W perp would be rather exhausting using the definition. You'd have to dot it with every single vector in W to see if it's zero. Well, there are infinitely many vectors in W, so that would take you forever. So what this says here is that if you have a spanning set for W, then X is in W perp, if and only if X dots to zero with the vectors in the spanning set. So for example, if W is spanned by two vectors, then a vector's in W perp if it dots to zero with those two vectors. So that's a much more manageable task. So here's some examples. If W is spanned by this single vector, describe W perp. That's a little vague, describe W perp, but here we go, W perp is the set of all vectors in R3, I'm going to use linear notation, x comma y comma z, so in R3, such that these vectors dot, x comma y comma z, dot 6, negative 2, 3 is 0. Because W is spanned by the single vector, so if you're in W perp, I only have to check that you're orthogonal to that one spanning vector. 6, negative 2, 3 is 0. Okay, more explicitly, that's the set of all x, y, z 
I'm going to leave off in R3, that's kind of automatic, set of all XYZ such that 6X minus 2Y plus 3Z is 0. That's a plane. So this is a line in R3. Here's R3. This is a line, the span of that vector, and then W uh, perp is the plane that goes through the origin that's perpendicular to that line. So I haven't drawn it very well. <laughs> Up here's a better picture. Okay, let's do another one. If W is spanned by two vectors, find a basis for W and W perp. So one of these is easy. Finding a basis for W is super easy. Remember, a basis has to have two things. It has to span and be linearly independent. Well, V1 and V2 span by definition, because W is the span of those two vectors. They're linearly independent because it's two vectors and one's not a multiple of the other. So for a basis, just take V1 and V2. Okay, basis for W perp requires a little bit of work. A vector is in W perp, and these are vectors in R4, by the proposition above, I only have to check that the vector in R4 dots to 0 with V1 and dots to 0 with V2. So I've written that equation, dots to 0 with V1 here and dots to 0 with V2 here. That's a linear system. I want um, a basis for the solution set. It's homogeneous. So what I want is a basis for null A. Basis for null A, where A is the coefficient matrix, 1, 0, negative 1, negative 1, and then 0, 1, negative 1, 1. So that's what I want. Okay, so I want to reduce A augmented with 0, 1, 0, negative 1, negative 1, 0, 1, negative 1, 1, augmented with 0. Well, it's already in reduced echelon form, so I'm done reducing. And so now I want to find a basis for the solution space. So I've got four variables. Let's start at the bottom. x4 is free because it's not a pivot column. So that's t. x3 is free. Call it s. x2 is a pivot column, so that's not free. That's s minus t. Remember, you got to move stuff to the other side. And then x1 is s plus t. So a basis for null a is going to be the s vector and the t vector. So I'm going to have two vectors in my in my basis. Basis for, and this is a basis for w perp. Okay, I'm going to have the, the vector corresponding to the s's would be 1, 1, 1, and then 0. And then the vector corresponding to the t's would be 1, negative 1, 1, negative 1, 0, 1. Okay, so I'm doing more in, your, um, in this lecture than your, your homework's going to ask. Your homework's going to be asking you for a bunch of... Um, just basically computations, dotting and distance and things like that. But I want to preview something that's really important. When we talk about orthogonal complements, let's look at a huge application in terms of matrix spaces. So A is an M by N matrix. So think of A as a mapping from Rn to Rm. And let's just review the four matrix spaces and where they live. Null A lives over here. Null A is the set of vectors that A kills, that A sends to zero. Row A also lives over here. Call A is the range of A. That lives over here. And a matrix um, space that we don't use very often, but it's still out there, is Null A transpose. And that lives over here. Now, they live in these spaces in a special way. And that's what this theorem is all about. This theorem says that row A perp is null A. So 
vectors in null A will dot to zero with vectors in row A. Any vector in here will dot to zero with any vector in there. And over here, the same thing happens. Call A perp is null A transpose. So any vector in call A will dot to zero with any vector in null A transpose. And here is an example illustrating that very theorem. I've got a two by three matrix A. And so I want to think of A as a mapping from R3 to R2. And let's just go through and look at these four spaces and what they look like. Null A and row A live over here in R3. So they're subspaces of R3. Find a basis for null A. So what I did is I took A and I augmented with zero and I reduced, took one step. This is what I get. So let's see, let's start at the bottom. X3 is T, X2 is S, it's also free. X1 is T. So a basis for null A would be, my S vector would be 0, 1, 0, and my T vector will be 1, 0, 1. Okay, so there, there are two linearly independent vectors in R3. They span a plane. So, and I've drawn that plane. This is null A here, this green plane. Let's find a basis for row A. Now, um, if you'll remember the rules for finding basis for row A, you take the reduced matrix. So here's my reduced A over here. And you take the non-zero vectors in there. So a basis for row A is just going to be 1, 0, negative 1. I'll write it as a, as a, uh, as a row vector. All right, so a single non-zero vector in R3 spans a line. So I've drawn that line over here. This is row A, the span of that single vector. Now, they're, they're aligned in such a way that any vector in null A, in this plane, is perpendicular to any vector in row A. And you can show that because if you're in row A, you're a multiple of 1, 0, negative 1. And if you're in null A, you're a linear combination of these two vectors, which I, which I wrote there. And if you take any vector in row A and you dot it with any vector in null A, you get 0. So they're orthogonal. All right, so that takes care of R3. Let's look at what happens over there in R2. So call A and null A transpose are subspaces of R2. Let's find a basis for call A. Remember, A reduces to this matrix here. And so for, to find a basis for call A, you look at the pivot columns of the reduced matrix, and you don't take those. You take the corresponding um, columns from A. So the first column in the reduced A has a pivot, so I want the first column of A, which is 1, 2. There's a basis for call A. That's a line. Well, that spans a line in R2. So call A is all multiples of that line. Then to find a basis for null A transpose, I went ahead and wrote down A transpose augmented with zero. And I did one operation to reduce that to reduced echelon form. And so if we want a basis for null A transpose, we need to write down the solution. X2 is free, it's T. X1 would be negative 2T. So a basis would be negative 2, 1. So again, that this um, span of that single vector is a line in R2. And it's perpendicular to the line spanned by 1, 2. If you take any multiple of 1, 2 and you dot it with any multiple of negative 2, 1, you're going to get 0. And so here's call A. Here's null A transpose. They're orthogonal. 
So that's a, a really good illustration of that theorem. And that is the end of this section.